Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third and final session of today's partner breakout. I am Deanna Burkhart, producer and field services administrator for the Illinois Soybean Association, and thank you for all for attending this session. I'm pleased to introduce this afternoon's speaker, AJ Woodyard of Advanced Agrolytics. AJ is the research agronomy lead with Ag Ingenuity Partners, the research division of Advanced Agrolytics. In that role, he is responsible for bringing innovative research concepts and performance insights to industry partners. With his previous work with high yield growers across the United States and unique experience with ultra early planted high management soybeans, AJ brings a practical approach to field scale spatial research. He holds a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Illinois in crop and weed sciences and remains involved in his family farming operation in East Central Illinois, bringing his research concepts back home. This afternoon, AJ will discuss more about a novel approach to soybean variety characterization that can more accurately inform placement decisions and provide insight into variety specific management, making the connection between branches and bushels. Before we get started, just a reminder to please use microphones uh, during the Q&A period so that others in the room and those online can hear your questions. Thank you, and please join me in welcoming AJ. All right, first, check, check, check. Can everybody, let me make sure I get this. Can we hear me okay? Sound good? Okay, perfect. Well, that, that was, appreciate the introduction. That, uh, I obviously didn't write that because I cannot write that well, so that sounded way better than what I actually am. Um, I, <clears throat> this is always, and, and I really appreciate the Soybean Association allowing me the opportunity to come in. Um, this is fun for me because most probably wouldn't know it based on my sister's name, last name not being the same anymore, but my sister is a part of the ISA and presented a couple sessions before. And uh, so, you know, I'm accustomed to her being AJ's little brother. And when I come here, the ISA staff treats me as Jennifer's, and Jennifer's uh, older brother. I'm no longer, I don't have a name now. So I know how she's felt all her life. Um, but I also know that she must not have made the agenda because she would have known better than to put me in the last time slot. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be here till five o'clock. I hope all of you don't have anywhere to be after four. So, uh, but really, really do appreciate the opportunity and, and want to share a, a unique concept or unique approach that, that our group at Advanced Agrolytics has developed and patented around soybean variety characterization and ultimately also get into maybe some unique insights into how we think about taking this characterization not only to placement but also to management of varieties. And, um, and so kind of before I get into the nuts and bolts and the details of, of that approach, I do think it's, it's probably good for me to give a little bit of background because how many people in the room have heard of advanced agrolytics? Okay, more than, more than I would have expected. So. Um, so just, just a, a very brief background then, since most have. Our, our group is relatively new. Uh, we, we've rapidly expanded since 2019, so about four years in the Midwest. Uh, we operate in, in the states in green, and, and we've got two different business units. One that works directly with growers on basically year-round agronomic guidance and advice uh, from, from recommendations uh, across the board in corn and soybeans and wheat as well. And then we have a second division of our business called Ag Ingenuity Partners, which is focused on working uh, business to business. So working with, with major partners in the industry from nutrient use efficiency, you know, sustainability, biologicals, the seed side, crop protection, fertility. Uh, we work in all those business units and bring kind of our unique approach to research into other business units. and, and um, maybe bring some, some approaches that they're not able to do internally to look at their products. So that's, that's the, the two business units of ours. Uh, the Ag Ingenuity Group is also really important for funneling some of the research ideas into our grower direct business on advanced agrolytics. Um, but, you know, as I look at this, and, and for those that, that you know, the introduction kind of covered this, but most that probably know me, I've got a long history of being a, a aficionado of soybeans, very passionate about soybeans, uh, really enjoyed the conversation from Chris this morning, and there's quite a few things I can key back in on that he brought up as well. 
Um, and, and if anybody was in the previous session, you know that Connor talked about pods per acre and seeds per pod and weight per seed in the soybean session previously and the importance of those three pieces for the yield equation. And I've always been a, a big advocate that those are the, the three things that we have to understand and they're the three things that we can influence in soybeans. If we can impact all three of them, we get a major win. But in most cases, if we can just impact two of the three, pods per acre and weight per seed, that's a huge win. I've got a whole bunch of things here on the, on the slide that Connor covered really well in his session, but are things that I think of as just today prerequisites. I mean, when I started after high yield soybeans back in 2015, um, you know, there wasn't a ton of early planted soybeans at that time. It was still kind of an early concept. Uh, fungicide and insecticide had been in the market, but was maybe starting to really gain momentum. You know, we had some seed treatments, but we were really seeing some more novel seed treatments brought into the marketplace at that time. So we developed a system over years that consistently produced more yield. And so you got these things, I would say, are the, are the core foundational pieces over years that we quickly realized they were foundational for success. Interestingly for me, so four years ago when I left BASF and, and made a change to advanced agrolytics, part of that was a drive for new tools and new innovations and a, and a new ability or a new way to be able to look at things, um, a, an entrepreneurial spirit, so to speak, because farmers were, were coming to me at that point and saying, hey, we have, we have really moved our yields over the last several years, implementing a lot of these approaches. And for some reason, you guys are never happy because then it was, well, what else you got? What's next? And everybody's constantly looking for what's that next competitive advantage I can obtain in the marketplace. And I'm going to be honest with you, it's been pretty tough sledding the last few years and finding those next big hammers. We haven't found a planning date just magically arrive out of, out of thin air in Illinois. So... I have the little fruit tree on the, on the right-hand side because I think we plucked a whole bunch of low-hanging fruit in this base system, and then it became what's next. And there's a lot of different areas that we've talked about and we've explored. We heard about some different, maybe novel concepts this morning, um, but, but quite frankly, none of them have just been a clear slam dunk. And so part of, part of my uh, motivation to come to Advanced Agrolytics was to try to get into an environment where we could think differently about soybeans and try to drive a next level of change. And, and I want to show this because I think this is really critical to understanding what we're going to get into in the conversation today. Core to our approach and the way I think about everything I approach today, from a nitrogen program in corn to fertility to biologicals when we test biologicals, all the way to soybeans and, and characterizing varieties. We start with environment, we isolate mechanism, and we view yield as an outcome. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through these pieces here quickly just to make sure I, I, everybody's tracking. Um, view yield as an outcome, we'll start there. How many in the room think you can accurately predict field by field what your yields are gonna be in 2024? I don't have any takers, so why is that? And I do know a lot of people in this room, so I will pick on people if we don't get audience participation. So, why don't we think we can accurately predict it today? We, I heard Mother Nature, I heard weather. You know, there's, there's not a, a really reliable way, but, but basically it's because, as Chris referenced this morning, we can't predict Mother Nature at a 50% success rate a day ahead of time, let alone six months ahead of time. So we have no clue what Mother Nature is going to throw us. So we can all agree that yield is unpredictable, right? Yield is just an outcome. It's an outcome of the influencers that occur during that season. So what about environment? If we start with environment, and I'm gonna, we'll do a little caricature here. So I've got acre A, and forgive me, I am not an artiste, so this isn't pretty, but I think it'll get the idea across. I've got acre A, darker soil, probably higher organic matter in the lower landscape. I've got acre B up in the higher landscape, a lighter looking soil type. If I ask the question, and if 2024 is a dry year, which one of these acres is going to get dry first? Acre A or acre B? This isn't, this isn't a trick question. B, yes, very good. Okay, now, which acre is going to get dry first if 2024 is a wet year? Sometimes I trick people with that one. I can't think about that one for a minute. Yeah, it's acre B. So is environment 
subfield environment predictable within the field? If you know what weather is, yes, but, but we know that there are some predictabilities to the subfield acre and the environments within a field. There is more predictability there than trying to predict yield today. A lot of those attributes are not going to change year over year. So then, then here's the, the, to what I, what I think of as a special sauce and what our business does, and that's isolating mechanism. And <clears throat> I could talk about mechanisms all day that are influenced in those different environments and, and the influence that, or the importance of understanding mechanism in an, in an environment uh, to make management decisions. But I'm going to talk specifically about the mechanism of building soybean yield today. And I think we would all agree that one of the challenges about soybeans is when you think you've got them figured out, you don't. And trying to figure them out is, about as, as, uh, is going to be about as fun as beating your head against that wall for two hours straight. It's a challenging crop to understand because of the nature of soybeans being willing to compensate and, and maybe the lack of what we would think of as repeatability. So as we started off on trying to think about a new way to classify and understand variety characterization, because we knew getting the right variety on the right acres was going to be really important to maximize yield, we had to find a repeatable mechanism, something that year in and year out would be repeatable that we could rely on that then would allow us to pair it with the known of environment. And if we could get those two things right, then it increases our probability of winning. Because ultimately, what we want to do in this room as, as growers, same in our operation, if it's a good year for all the farmers, I want to be a little bit better than, than the good. If it's a bad year, I want to be better than, than those that are bad. We want to consistently try to increase our probability of winning. If we can describe environment and we can isolate and describe mechanism and put those two things together, it increases our probability of winning. So this was actually a field we were in in, in 2020, and um, we were, I was with a, a few of our, our team members, and, and we were talking, and one of the, the founders of Advanced Agrolytics was out there in the field with us, and he was asking me about what I look for when I think about soybeans. And I said, well, and, and a lot of people in this room, especially in central Illinois, will remember ASGRO 36X6, and I said, the 36X6 was a variety that I remember really well in that if you planted it early, it, it yielded exceptionally well, but if you planted it later in the year, it just became a bean. And he made a, a profound statement to me that will stick with me forever. He said, um, if, it's, if it's repeatable, it's measurable. You just need to know what to measure. And, and that was what, I, what led us down this path of finding something in a, in a mechanistic standpoint that would be repeatable in soybeans that we can measure year over year. Why is this important? Well, I think you, you probably all have, have uh, had the experience of maybe being overjoyed with an outcome of yield that's occurred in a season in a field and maybe sometime been disappointed in an outcome that's occurred. And we, we started doing work of, and these are whole field strips of uh, multiple varieties, and you can see, you know, there's, there's variability across these strips, uh, within the strips and, and between products, right? And so if I've got that red circle and the blue circle, what do you think are the differences between those two environments? What do you think is the difference between the red and the, the blue circle? Yep, what do you think is the higher elevation? <laughs> yeah, that is a good point. So this was a, this was a dry year, and uh, the red circle is the, the higher acre. So if we look at a 3D image, you can pr pretty clearly see there's an elevation change that existed in that field. And we can also start to note, though, that between products, there are some differences in how they handle each of those environments too. And <clears throat> this was, this is the, what I, what I think is the unique nature of, of our business model is the ability to parse out and separate that performance within each of those environments and, and really be able to see that, you know, one variety may be really good up on that knob and not so good in the lower acre and vice versa. 
um, and, and parse out and understand those differences that are occurring at a subfield level. So saturated water limited acres in the red and the blue. Essentially, all of this led us down the path of a, a mechanism. And, you know, in 2020, we went on a, a, a broad scale effort to, to look at everything we could in soybeans. We harvested plants multiple timings throughout the year. We looked at plant mass. Um, you know, we looked at number of nodes at, at, on June 21st at the summer solstice. We were looking for anything that we could correlate to subfield performance and draw back to a mechanism that would lead to understanding performance at a subfield level. And all through the season, we were kind of thinking, man, I don't know that plant biomass is going to be the story. I, you know, I, I don't know that total number of nodes is going to be the story. And then we got to the end of the year, and we, we decided, you know, we're going to go out and harvest individual plants. We're going to bring them back. And uh, luckily, I've got a, a really good team that... Uh, that literally hand shelled. This year we hand shelled about 150,000 pods within our organization. And, um, and what we uncovered out of all that is that where varieties built their yield was a direct correlation to how they performed at the subfield level. And so I've got two examples here on the left and on the right. I, I think we can all agree on the left, we probably got a variety that's branching a little more. On the right, one that's more main stem, right? What, what have we been historically taught about soybeans? If you give them space, what do all soybeans do? Branch. All soybeans compensate, right? And that's a factual statement. What, uh, what is also true is that the ability or the magnitude to which they compensate is very, very different. And that was the, the magic pill in all of this, this work that we did. So we, have, we had gone through a process once we uncovered, and, and for multiple years we were able to correlate back where plants were building yield. And we'll get back into the characteristics of this, but where plants were building yield directly correlated to subfield performance and where they had their best performance um, within a field or, or across an operation. If you looked at, hey, what type of variety do I want on my farm? And we classified these into two groups. We had the high VPI products. So we, we um, I'm sorry, we patented this, what we call our variety profile index. And instead of saying variety profile index every time, I'm gonna shorten it to VPI. So we had high VPI products and we had low VPI products. And we had this wide range within the industry of how much varieties would compensate with branching to make up yield. So left, high VPI, right, low VPI, branch yield, primarily main stem. Why, why did this matter? And, and it's really interesting, and, and this is kind of fascinating, because frankly, it's a bit counterintuitive to what was maybe out in the industry at, at times. So we, we may have thought at one point that, hey, if we have a stress acre, what type of bean were we trying to get onto a stress acre? What were we historically taught in terms of the type of bean we want to put on a stress acre. Defensive, but what kind of characteristics? So if, if I go back, and I've, I've done quite a bit of this, you look up old extension articles, it was get varieties that can cover the rows as quickly as possible. And oftentimes it was referenced get branching varieties that can make sure they close the rows on a stress acre. Now, while I totally agree that you want to close the rows as quickly as you can on a more transitional acre, what we also know, and, and if we look at these two charts, this is essentially yield stability. And you're looking at the main stem as we increase nighttime temperature. So this is a stress. You could name any number of stresses that you want to name, and they're all going to act the same. But we're increasing nighttime temperature, and we're looking at the effect on yield, or main stem weight in this case, so main stem and branches. So look as we increase nighttime temperature, what happens with our branch yield? That's the first yield that starts to decrease. We see stability on the main stem. If we're going to abort yield under stress, the first place it's going to be kicked off is, is off the branches. So there's, there was background in the literature to say that it was very likely that a 
product that's more main stem is going to perform better on a more transitional acre. Um, we were just able to start looking at performance, parse out subfield acres and pair that together and say, we can absolutely validate on stress acres. You want to make sure you're more main stem. When you get into environments that you can take advantage of branching, then there's an opportunity with a more branching variety. This, I want to make one thing clear. This doesn't define yield potential. You can have high yielding branching varieties. You can have high yielding uh, main stem varieties. What it helps to guide you on is to make sure you get them placed as well as you possibly can to take advantage of their characteristics. So if I, if I just sort of summarize the, uh, the, the characteristics of high and low VPI products. So we start on the left with, with our high VPIs or our high branching varieties. We're obviously, the strengths here, we're building more yield from branches. Within that, those varieties will excel when they have an environment that supports branching. So I go back, let's just make sure we're all tracking. I go back to acre B, or acre A and acre B. If I got a variety that wants to branch a lot, where do I want it to be? Right here, take advantage. We've got the environment to take advantage of all that additional branch yield and to support it. So as soil, water, and organic matter increase, so does the performance potential of that type of a variety in that environment. Where we get risk with these high VPI or high branching varieties, they cannot support that yield component as well on their branches if you get one of two things. If you get dry weather or you get transitional acres. And you know, I, I think this has been really eye-opening to me as I think about 2022 and 2023, both pretty, especially dry early seasons, but in some places dry for a lot of the season. And if we start to aggregate data and, and we look at known products that are in the high VPI camp and known products that are in the low VPI camp, and I tell you, we all know that 2022 and 2023 were both dry years. Which of those buckets do you think had better performance overall knowing that across the board? Higher or low products? Yeah, the low VPIs, the last two years have been more consistent performers. 2021, we had some knock the socks off high yields with some of these high branching varieties where we, um, we had a lot of moisture season long. But this branching gets initiated much earlier than probably most ever thought about. I walk a lot of fields now and you'll see this branching initiating at V2, V3 and starting to occur. If you're really, really dry early, you start to limit the potential for that branch yield being built right out of the gate. So dry early seasons have an impact ultimately on the ability to, to build that, that branch yield potential. And you know, in that circumstance, when you get really, really dry early season weather, it, has, it will have an impact and has some limitations on those products that fall in the left-hand bucket. Okay, so over on the right-hand side now, our low VPIs. Way more yield consistently coming from the main stem on these products. They'll handle transition and risk of dry weather. We see this over and over and over. As soil, water, and organic matter will decrease, they get more stability. Again, doesn't mean you can't have high yielding low VPI products. You absolutely can. They will handle stressful conditions better, whether that be from mother nature or within a field. <clears throat> the you know, there, there is in the perfect environment where these things do have a risk is they might lose out on the very top end yield potential. And, and you know, Chris referenced this this morning, the, the desire and appetite to get all the branches and, and build all that branch yield on his plants. And I would agree, if I've got a variety with a propensity to build a lot of yield on branches and I give it an environment like, like he's able to, to drive incredibly high yields, there's gonna be more opportunity over here. It's an opportunistic thing. Um, where you've got that opportunity to build more branch yield. <clears throat> so we do a fair amount of, of testing. We've got some partners, BASF is one of them that we've worked really closely with in, uh, in, in looking at their variety portfolio. I've hidden names of varieties to protect the innocent here, but what I want to lay out is that there's a, a wide representation of varieties in the industry. Uh, within portfolios, if you look within a, an individual portfolio, you'll see a nice spread typically of, of lower and higher VPI products. And, and then if you look just industry-wide, you can see everything from, and 
The numbers don't mean a lot. What I'm just telling you is that if it's a lower number, it branches less. It's a lower VPI product. If it's a higher number, it branches more. It's a high VPI product. So you can see that there's a pretty broad range in all these varieties that we're laying out here. <clears throat> and with this knowledge, you know, there's a few things. Um, I think with this knowledge, you can, you can get better at, at how you think about what varieties make sense for your farm, how you think about managing the varieties, but also as we turn over varieties really quickly, part of the advantage is how do I, how do I take advantage of genetic improvements while also not being scared of the risk of trying something brand new broadly. And this, this knowledge helps us make sure that we avoid train wrecks with, with brand new products. When we understand how they're building their yield, it gives us an advantage in how we place them for success right out of the gate before they've had a lot of, of commercial exposure. So the, the next step in, in our journey, so we've just talked about mapping the variety mechanism and understanding the, the branch potential. I've already talked about, you know, and that was our mechanism, that's our plant mechanism. I've talked about the importance of the environment, the subfield environment and our fields and the, the OM, the CEC, the slopes, uh, all of those things that are either topographic or soil layers that we think about in our operations. How can we now take what we know about the varieties and then map it to our fields? That was our, our next challenge, to try to simplify, because you may be looking at me saying, man, I, this is all great, but I've got I, what I think is all flat fields, or I've got elevation changes. How do I know where I'd put a higher low VPI product? And um, you know, it, one thing I've learned in this business is it doesn't matter if you've got one foot of elevation change in your fields or 12 feet, we all have these variable environments that require a different recipe for success. We've, we've seen that over and over again in, in our work um, in both corn and soy. So what we wanted to do next was take the plant mechanism and now fix it to the field environments. So here's a satellite image of a field. Doesn't really tell me a whole lot other than it's, it's a picture of a field. What we did was we looked at all of the factors that are influencing soybean yield and we weighted those factors differently to create a proprietary layer within our business that we call our, fittingly, we're very creative, our variety profile index or VPI layer. <laughs> so we're, we're pretty creative here. So here's, our, here's the field looking at it in a little different manner. This is laying a VPI layer over the top of that satellite image. And again, it's, this is, these are just indices on the side. They, they, they don't pay attention to the numbers. What it's telling you is that as we go from this north end of this field, where you've got more of these oranges and maybe light greens, these are transitional acres. These are low VPI acres. These are acres that we know have factors in them uh, that have a lot of risk against yield. Uh, they probably have more slope, they've got lower organic matter, those type of, of factors. And when we get down into these purples and blues, like you see down in the south end of this field, those are the high VPI acres. Again, acres that are more likely to have the propensity to support a variety that's build, building yield on branches. So this is a kind of a complex background layer that we, we simplify to look this way to just help us guide, engage, and characterize the fields to understand how much exposure we've got to areas in that field that will be classified as, as high VPI versus low VPI. Now I can essentially have the mechanism of the plant or the variety, if I have that known mechanism, and I can pair it to the environment using the same methodology. This is essentially a tactic to try to ensure that we, um, that we increase our probability of, of having success with the varieties we're using. Now, you probably look at this and, and maybe think like I do and say, boy, this, does, AJ, does this provide the opportunity down the road? Is, is multi-variety gonna be something that we should be thinking about? And the technology planter-wise is there. Um, and, and I think as I look at the yield potential opportunity to be gained by getting the right variety in the right place, the answer is gonna be yes. Uh, I think there's gonna be an opportunity to use a methodology like this to get to multi-variety 
in the near future. So just so you don't think I'm completely blowing smoke here, I'm, I'm going to show a little bit of, of, uh, of yield data to, to support the concept. So for this to all work, there was one really, really important thing that we had to prove. And that was if you got VPI off of a product, if you classified it as high or low VPI in a, let's say, 2021, for example here, that had to actually carry over into a completely different year with different weather and still show that it increased your probability of success, right? Because if we scored these two products and then they flip-flopped on yield the next year, this was a waste of time. We, we really didn't achieve anything. And <clears throat> so we've got product A and product B here. Product A in green is a, is a low, what we classify as a low VPI product. Uh, product B would be a high, and <clears throat> so that was a score taken in 2021. Within our data analysis, when we look at variety performance year over year, what we're able to do is take our strip trials um, and lay them across these different environments in the field, and then we're able to parse out the product performance in high and low VPI areas of the field and look at, you know, did one variety perform better than another in each of those environments. So we've classified the products. Again, we've classified the environments. We lay our trial work over the top of, of this layer. And then we come back and we look at the probability in 2022, completely different weather year, that this accurately predicted performance, or at least increased our confidence from a 50-50 chance of winning. So this is the 2022 field win rate <coughs> by our VPI bins. So start on the left, we got our high VPI bins here. So these are our good areas of the field, our good acres in the field, and we're looking at the probability of product A or product B winning in those good areas of the field. And what you see, high VPI bins, good areas, we have a 60% win rate with our high VPI product and a 40% win rate with our low. If we flip flop that and now go to these, these orange areas across our and these, these trials will be taking place from, from Iowa to Ohio, so really broad scale testing here. If we go to all these low VPI areas and, and fields that we tested in and we aggregate those bins, guess what happens with our performance, those products? Flip flops. And all of a sudden now, product A has a six, over 60% win rate. The low VPI product wins in that environment. So, a classification in 2022, or 2021, I'm sorry, predicted or increased our probability of success in 2022. And that's, after doing this now for multiple years, the really cool part is, this is incredibly, incredibly repeatable. Like, I, I, can, go, I can go walk brand new varieties that are not even commercially launched yet. I can look at about two or three locations and I've probably got a reasonably decent idea of, of how that's gonna shake out. And, and we, we see the same repeatable mechanism from Iowa all the way to Ohio with these varieties. We finally found something that, that you could repeat over and over and over with soybeans. How much were they willing to compensate? How much yield were they building on their branches? Now the, the, the one watch out and you know, the reason that we actually still go through a process of, of physically um, sampling and, and physically scoring these varieties. Sometimes you can get products that look like they're gonna be high branchers, they'll put branches on, but they, they don't actually put any yield there. And my experience has been, that's like, those are the ones you wanna, you wanna if, you're in a, uh, if you're in an advancement team at a, at a seed company, you wanna find the door pretty quickly because if I'm wasting energy on trying to put on branches and then I don't, I don't put any yield on them, that's not a good combination. And we tend to find those are not top performers, the ones that, that act that way. So you do have to be a little bit careful to just think you can walk out and say, oh, because it's got branches, that means it's high VPI. Not always the case. We do find varieties that, uh, that buck that trend. <clears throat> Okay, so what's the risk of being wrong? And just, again, aggregated data over multiple years, what we tend to see is if we get the wrong, 
the wrong mechanism and the wrong environment, it's typically a three to six bushel disadvantage. So there's, what I'm telling you is, and, and again, this is across all products we test, but what I'm telling you is there's an opportunity. And while this isn't a low hanging fruit, it's maybe closer to the middle of the tree, it still brings some, some real yield opportunity to our operations by getting placement right. <clears throat> I've just got a, a few more things and then um, I'm gonna open it up to questions. So if we, if we understand soybean mechanism now, and we understand that we have products that tend to wanna to build yield on branches and those that tend not to, that's pretty powerful information because it can allow us to do more than just place varieties. And, and that's been the, the next evolution as we've continued um, in our research internally to now understand, and I already referenced kind of the multi-variety concept. That's certainly an area and an opportunity that this opens up. But anybody want to guess what, what other opportunity this really quickly opens up if you, if you understand how a variety builds yield? Population. So you know, what we've, what we've uh, embarked on the last couple of years is field scale trials with products that we had known classifications of low or high VPI on, and <clears throat> looking at population responses once we understand that mechanism. So we know there's value to soybean product placement by mechanism, but the question was, is there value to management? Intuitively, I think we'd all say there probably would be if we knew this information. And the question then was, does this mechanism influence the optimal seeding rate for a given variety? Should our, our population curve change based on the type of variety or the mechanism in which it builds yield? <clears throat> and, then, and then really ultimately the impact to, to us as growers, does this variety mechanism then give us the opportunity or the insight to either make adjustments to a flat seeding rate that we might put out in the field, one, or you know, if we are running some sort of a variable rate script, does it give us the opportunity to make adjustments to a, to a variable rate script if we know this about the variety. Th those were the, the outlying questions as we entered into this work. I'm gonna highlight some of our work here from, from 23. And so we had, <clears throat> we had uh, 19 locations where we looked at five seeding rates, and this is all field scale work. So field scale typically replicated twice of 80, 110, 140, 170, and 200,000. So we looked at a, a wide range where we tried to catch hopefully the lower end of that bell curve at 80 that might be feasibly being planted commercially and then, and then the upper end, you know, not, not too many probably planting at 200,000 these days, um, but tried to catch the upper end of that tail too. And again, we, we were looking at both low and high VPI products within this. And so, you know, just trial set up. Uh, we would lay this out across some of our proprietary layers in the background, and essentially, once we get back the yield data from, from our growers, um, we can then uh, parse out, again, the, the response to population across different environments, which is what makes this really cool. Um, you know, understand the performance in environments within each of those strips. There was a lot of talk this morning around trial setup and how do you get to the right answers and how do you account for variability. We, in our business, we try to drive to variability when we look at, at, at testing because we know we can go in and isolate those environments and compare like environments and get to answers at a sub, a sub field level within these strips. So here's just some pictures and guess what? If you think that uh, varieties compensate more when they get space, I can validate that. So key takeaways here. If you plant 200,000, you drive a product more main stem. If you plant at 80,000, you can get a, a candelabra. So this is a high VPI product, and, and what you notice at 80,000 is we're looking at six, six branches coming off of, of that main stem with this high VPI product, and even when we bump it clear up to 200,000, these high VPIs will tend to still try to branch. They actually are resilient in their desire and appetite to want to try to branch, but we clearly drove more of that yield to the main stem by pushing it to 200. The low VPI products, again, this is out of central Illinois as well. I failed to mention, 
if, if you looked at the Illinois data, there was a lot of it that was clustered from I-70 to, to uh, maybe a little bit north I-74. So a lot of our work this year was in central Illinois, probably relevant to a lot that are in this room. So we, we still get branches with a low VPI product at 80,000. All varieties do compensate. That is still a fact. We don't maybe get quite as much branching as what we saw in the previous picture. When we get this one out to 200,000, we've created a stick. That's, that's what this variety wants to do. It wants to go more main stem. So before I unveil the, um, some of the population responses, now with all this that I've shown, I tell you, we have products that want to branch, high VPI. We have products that don't want to branch that are, tend to be more main stem or branch less, low VPI. Which do you think would benefit from a lower population in general? Branching. Yeah, so I think we could generalize our thought process now to when we understand this mechanism, we would probably predict that a product that wants to branch more is going to do better at low populations. The way I've got these charts set up, essentially I've, I've just I've tried to make it simple to look at the deviation from trial average. So if it's red, it means it was negative against the, the trial average. If it's to the blue, it was positive. And this is just the high VPI products right now, okay? So this is a conglomeration of just the highs, and we'll show the lows here in a minute. Um, what you notice is a bit of a bell curve here. And we're, we, we have to understand economics within this too, right? So every 30,000 increase in, in uh, seeding rate, we need to get at least a bushel gain for that to be an economically good decision. So if we don't get plus a bushel, then it didn't really gain us much. So we see there's, there's two populations that are blue, 110 and 140. I don't think this is a massive surprise. And, and I'm, I'll let you in on a little insight. You know, you look at 80,000, it didn't have the best, it didn't have the best year in this trial set. It's 1.55 below trial average. Anybody want to guess why maybe the, the magnitude or why it wasn't as good in 2023 or why maybe you'd be, you were surprised that 80,000 was that much off. But any thoughts on why it might have been the lowest yielding in this trial work? Boom. Dry early season. So 80,000 on a variety that wants to branch and a really dry early season where we restrict some branching and guess what? 80,000 fell. That was too low. In a different year, it, it may not have shaken out quite that way. But Mother Nature still has an impact on what the optimal seeding rate is. If we look at the, the economic best population, 110,000. I mean, we get a little bit of a yield bump going to 140, but that's, that's not an economical improvement. So if I was just averaging, giving you an average, you know, on these high VPIs, 110 looks like a, a pretty sweet spot in 2023. <clears throat> okay, what, what do you suspect the, I said it's a bell curve with high VPIs, what do you think you see with lows this, in 2023? Knowing the way the year went. linear, linear response. So we, we still have 80,000 not being good. Makes a lot of sense. We have totally main stem varieties at, at 80,000 in a dry year. Uh, we, had, we didn't have enough plants. <clears throat> and you just see it stair step. And, and, and this may surprise people, but in 2023, and a bunch of these trials were in good black ground in central Illinois. I, I, I can tell you that. Um, we stair-stepped all the way to 200,000 with these low VPIs. Now, again, let's take it back to economics. You know, economically, we're probably somewhere in that 140 to 170 range that would have been um, the most economically viable number. But, but there's a, a linear trend. And, and quite frankly, I think we'd all agree a very different trend based on how the variety is building yield. Fair to say? Now, the magnitude of this response, remember 2023's weather, okay? That's, that's the one thing, I don't want anybody walking out of here saying, oh my gosh, AJ said we gotta plant 200,000 again across the board, because there's gonna be a lot of people that look at me pretty crazy when, if, if you walk out of here and say that. Uh, not what I'm saying. Magnitude of this response certainly impacted by the weather, but what it does tell us is that if we know we've got a really main stem variety, 
we want to be careful getting it, getting it too far down there, especially if we have any risk of, of stand attrition or stand loss. Okay, <clears throat> and then just if, and let me, let me walk through this. So what I've done now is take the, the high branching varieties and I've broken this out within each of the populations by different slope groupings. So I'm looking at less than 1% slope, really flat, 1% to 3% slope, and then greater than 3% slope. And you can probably expect that in a really dry year, we were stair-stepping the stress, and greater than 3% had the most stress. So <clears throat> here's the other nuance, and, and you know, how many variable rate soybeans in the room today? Very few. Okay. So <clears throat> if you were hypothesizing um, <laughs> about a, a variety that you know wants to branch, okay, it has a tendency to really want to branch, but you're taking it into a stress environment. You're taking it into a greater than 3% slope where you've got risk of losing that branch yield. How might you manipulate that variety with population in that environment? Jack it up. And <clears throat> that trend is, is fairly evident when you get to the greater than 3% slopes. Um, you have an opportunity by increasing population in that environment. Now, this product, and this, you know, this is for those that have maybe a little bit more variable fields. Um, if you've got that same variety, let's say you've got a field that's 90% relatively flat, and you've got a little bit of slope in the field, you're still going to want less plants on those low slope areas. So the way I tend to think about these high VPI products now in a variable rate program is your range of populations is going to be much wider. You're going to be low in your best acres, and you may actually be looking at driving your uh, population higher on your toughest or more transitional acres with that type of, of mechanism of yield. So it's a wider range of uh, population deviation. The, the low VPIs, and <clears throat> we didn't have a ton of, so I've just got this broken out by less than 1 and 1 to 3%, but think of it in the same manner of uh, you know, 1 to 3 getting to a little bit more stress, less than 1 being, being less. It, it, it's, this one's it's pretty clear. Like if we, are, if we were at 80 or 110, we lost. And um, you know, as we stair-stepped up in, in population, we started to win more and more. And so for me, when I think about these main stem products, and I've had a number of conversations this, this winter with growers who say, well, AJ, I, I didn't like the a variable rate population script that took me down to 100,000 or 110 on the low end on my, on my really good acres because I lost, I lost stand. I had some saturation, had, had stand attrition, and all of a sudden I had 60,000 or 70,000 final, and my yield was not very good. I, I lost yield, variable rate didn't work for me. And... I asked the question, you know, what, what variety was in those scenarios? And pretty much 100% of the time, it was a variety that built all of its yield on the main stem. So yeah, not surprised at all that, uh, that on the low end of a population script or a variable rate script, where we then lost, um, we lost some stand that we lost yield at really low populations with a main stem variety. No surprise at all to me there. So, you know, outside of just adjusting seeding scripts or thinking about population management, we're also using this knowledge in replant decisions. If I, if I have a known stand loss or stand attrition um, and it's occurred on a variety that is going to build all its yield on main stem and I'm down to 30, 40, 50,000 and I'm trying to decide, you know, what should I do, that, that knowledge helps give us a little bit more confidence in making the replant decision as well. So, just think about the different ways that understanding this mechanism can help you make more informed and educated decisions. Okay, so I actually lied. I'm going to be on time, which is great. If I just, just conclude the story and then let me answer questions because I'm, I'm going to be surprised if we don't have some questions here. 
So if I, if I just conclude this, this story up, there's three things I'd, I'd say take away here. VPI, novel approach, it's characterizing soybeans. It's given us insight into the mechanism, which then allows us to pair it to a, an environment and more confidently predict placement. Understanding VPI mechanism also influences our soybean population responses. I think that has been clear for two years in a row in our testing that there's a different, a different population curve based on this known mechanism. And, and lastly, what I'll leave you with that is absolutely true, what we started with, that we can't predict mother nature. Yield is just an outcome. Yield's an outcome of, of what uh, management decisions we make and what mother nature throws at us. So mother nature will still have influence over what the optimal seeding rate is. 2023 was a year where optimally we probably would have been a little bit higher than what we maybe would have been accustomed to. There's trends that clearly exist, and I hope what you're seeing from me is that by pulling these different levers, you can try to put yourself as a grower in a position to more consistently win and to try to mitigate some of the influence that mother nature may have over us. Can't influence it all, we try to mitigate it as best we can. Okay, I'm gonna stop, open it up to questions here or you know, anything else soybean related that, uh, that may be of interest in the room. Yes, sir. You're going, to have a whole, you're going to have a whole lot of trouble probably matching it all up without that known information. I mean, and <clears throat> I've, I've referenced, you probably caught it earlier, I referenced, you know, one portfolio that is publicly out there with, with the VPI score. So um, BASF has that along with the, the placement algorithm uh, available to their customers. And, and then we also, internally for our customer base, house some of that information as well. So today, those are the two avenues to get it. Um, we're always approaching and looking for other ways to get this further out into the marketplace, so there will be more opportunity to see it in the future. Today, those are the two places it exists. Yes. Yep. Yep. It's tough. And, and the reason I, and I'm not trying to dodge your question here, but the reason why it's tough is because bushy doesn't mean branchy. And some of the bushiest varieties I've seen have been some of the most main stem. So if you, if you purely try to get to this answer off of a, a seed guide saying, medium bush or, or bushy or not, you're not getting to branchy or not, and whether or not it builds yield on branches. So I, I personally can't confidently get there today just based off of what's in a commercial seed guide. I know you don't like that answer, but no, that's... Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I think <clears throat> this, uh, you know, that's, that's where this helps us get to the, the why, the why we're seeing what we're seeing. I, I, I and it, it's, it's a, it's, a, it's a repeatable mechanism that's actually correlating to an outcome. And I don't think you, it's hard for me to argue or hard for me to get my head wrapped around how does bushy, medium bushy, does that always correlate to an outcome? I'm not sure it does. It gives you something on general plan architecture, probably doesn't correlate to an outcome. AJ, thank you. And I've not been repeating the questions. I will start doing that. Thank you for your work with this, AJ. I wanted to ask, do you see other applications for this in terms of other inputs? I'm thinking specifically about 
pre-emergence PPOs or biologicals that specifically influence the branching to behave more like stems? Do you, do you see this being an application that we could use as a decision matrix for those kind of products? Do, do, would everybody have been able to hear that or should I repeat? Oh, you want me to repeat? The, the question was, is there, <clears throat> is there other management practices that we could correlate and use this, this information towards? Um, so, you know, biologicals, uh, you know, there, there could be any number of, of other management factors that potentially could be at play. I don't think there's any question. Do I have all the, the answers? You know, we're, we're trying to work our way through, I'll say I'm back to the low hanging fruit, right? Population was the easy one to get to. But I think once we understand this mechanism, you know, you brought up PPO herbicides and potential risks there. I mean, there's the variety tolerance aspect of it, but there is also this, hey, if I have reduced stand by, by some chance uh, and I have this information, it probably helps me in making a decision about the next step forward. So I would, I would say there's probably a lot of ways in which we can think about utility for this. And from a management perspective, we're just on the tip of the iceberg of, you know, what is what fertility influence is there on these on these two different mechanisms? What might be a biological influence? I mean, I don't know all the answers, but I'm gonna guess there is an impact. What's your gross basing on, on these studies and, and the influence it has? Yep. What's the row spacing and influence that it has? So I'm, I referenced this as pretty broad. Um, it's pretty broad testing, so it's across broad geographies, and we get into everything from, it's, it's almost, I mean, get 15, 20s, and 30s, so we'll get all three of those. And, you know, I, I would say, generally speaking, that the narrower rows that give you more inter-row space do promote additional branching. So that inter-row space is probably as or more important than the within between row space. So the tr what I would say though is that the trends are exactly the same whether you're in 15s, 20s or 30s. Like we can look at these varieties and a, a high branching variety is always going to be higher branching regardless of row spacing. The magnitude might be just a little bit different whereas you may branch the most in a narrow row. That makes sense? But your but your magnitude it's not going to change what's a high VPI product, what's a low VPI product. You're still going to see that same trend exist. You don't like my answer, so what? <laughs> You, you can, and, and I, would, I would agree to a certain extent. So you can manipulate the amount of branching with population, but, and to me that becomes really important to drive more population when you get to, when you want to take a branching variety and really drive it to main stem. But what it takes away from is that opportunity we see by building a lot of yield on branches in the good environments, because that, opportunistically from an, an economic benefit standpoint, I can maximize yield, maximize profitability at lower populations with high VPI products on the really good acres. Yeah, but that's all I want to play with is, is your high VPI. Yeah, and that's fine. Yep. And you, you absolutely can think about how you can pull levers to manipulate it once you understand that mechanism too. The, the watch out, The watch out, I think, in my brain after looking at, or at least to, to that point, of, after looking at enough data, if you do have a really dry year and you do have transitional acres, your higher VPI products, even when you try to manipulate it with population, will lose to your more main stem varieties. That's the watch out. That's tough to answer. I mean, that depends on, the question was how much, by how much do they lose? I mean, that's variety to variety. I mean, in general, I think this past year, our data showed about a four bushel difference between 
true lows, and they were four, lows were four bushel better than highs on average, aggregated. That was regardless, so that's aggregated broadly. It was a, 2023 was a phenomenal year for main stem varieties. Mm -hmm. It was the opposite. High branch varieties were better, about same magnitude, high branch varieties were better than 2021. And we had an, same population. And, and what you see, if you, if you look at, so those scores I was showing, so if you look at how much yield's being built on branches, in 2021, we had substantially more yield. You could, you could measure it on the same varieties tested year after year, substantially more yield built in 2021. So in a year where we did have really good rainfall early and we were able to build branch yield, it correlated all the way out to the end of the year. The last two years, those same varieties, if we look at amount of yield built on branches, it was lower. Okay. I get, uh, the question I have is, um, yep. there's been talk, I've heard of people doing some blending, you know, varieties of the same maturity, relatively the same maturity, and for different protection reasons. It seems to me this may be an opportunity to blend these two and uh, kind of based on your soil types, you can kind of pick maybe a percentage blend to kind of protect you from one year, one may do better than the other. Have you guys done any experiment or you know, any studies with that blending? Yeah, I think everybody probably heard that question. Um, I, we haven't specifically yet done any experimentation with it, but I can tell you it's come up in more than one conversation with, with um, groups that are thinking about blending variety. So it, it does. I mean, if I look at, if, it, it, for me, it's what, what we've been trying to harp on is it's an opportunity to make sure that you have representation in your portfolio of both of those options so that if you are looking at something like a blend, you, you want to identify good varieties that are both low and VPI in the same maturity range so you have that opportunity, right? I mean, because today, most companies don't actually know what their portfolio looks like in this regard. They may have a whole portfolio of low VPI products in an early maturity range, and then more of a blend and later. They don't, a lot of them don't know today what that blend is. But I think conceptually, in the absence of truly like targeting a, a specific variety to a specific environment with multi-variety, a blend option makes a lot of sense. I'm going to get kicked off, I bet, soon, but let me, okay, yep. Uh, as you guys were identifying different uh, yield characteristics and plant characteristics, did you come up with your VPI? Did you look at at least shape and size? Okay, so the question was around leaf shape and size, and was there any correlation to that in yield? Um, I, I can speak anecdotally. I, I don't know that I can, I can speak with data to that question. I can speak anecdotally and say that there were high VPI varieties that had different leaf architectures. There were lows that did. And so it's about like the, the bushy question. It, it didn't necessarily, I would say, I would have a hard time believing there'd be a high correlation to yield. And I don't think there was a high correlation to the mechanism either based on leaf structure. Oh man, <laughs> this is, so the question was, do, uh, is there root structure differences? And um, <laughs> there is. The same? Uh, now you're asking too many questions. <laughs> I'll just say there is, there is. Okay, I think we're 
that Thank time. You. Yep. Thank you, AJ.